All right, as I mentioned before, this is probably my favorite chapter, definitely my favorite chapter in 1 Kings, but one of my favorite chapters just overall. I mean, I love this story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal and just the whole scene that's played out there. We're going to go through this, of course, verse by verse like we normally do. But um, I also had the extra blessing being on the camping trip this last week where uh, Pastor Jimenez actually preached on the first part here of, of chapter 18. And I would recommend if you haven't heard that, I think it's up online now, you could you could find his sermon up on the internet and, uh, and listen to that. I'm sure you'll be edified by it, but I'm going to actually be touching on a lot of things that, that he brought up because it's very good truth and knowledge there about Obadiah here. We're going to start reading. Let's, let's jump back here to verse number one. Bible reads, and it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go, Show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So you remember last week we talked about Elijah praying for there to be no rain, and that um, you know God led him to the brook, and the ravens were, were commanded to feed him with bread and with flesh, and he was drinking of the brook until that dried up, and then he went to the widow woman's house, and uh, she was commanded to take care of him there, where the, the, the crews of oil and the, and the meal didn't fail for all the time that he was there. So now he's getting a new commandment because now it's been many days. Now it's coming on like that three years, that three and a half years when, when, um, that they've had no rain in the land. And uh, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah, says here in the third year, saying, go, you know, now it's time to go show yourself unto Ahab. And Ahab was a wicked king. And we don't get that much into all the wickedness of Ahab here. But there's a lot of things that Ahab does that's extremely wicked. If you remember, I think, I think it was covered either last week or the week before, just briefly, without going into detail about everything, that he had done more wickedly than everyone else that was before. Remember about two weeks ago, we went through these, these extremely wicked, you know, Amri and Zimri and, and those wicked kings of Israel and how things just got worse and worse and worse. So Ahab is even worse than everyone else that was before him. And... Um, that's why this judgment is coming down upon the land is because of all this extreme wickedness of, of this no rain and everything. So um, now God's finally saying, okay, you're going to show yourself unto Ahab. Verse number two says, and Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab and there was a sore famine in Samaria. Of course, famine is a lack of food. Makes perfect sense. When it's not raining, your crops aren't going to grow. It's going to be a lot harder to grow food. So there is a lack of food. Verse number three, and Ahab called Obadiah which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So we're introduced now to Obadiah. Obadiah is, was the governor or the, like the ruler of Ahab's house. So he held a position. Ahab was his employer. And he's... And he's um, he holds this position with Ahab, a kind of important position with him. And Ahab was extremely wicked, but we're told here Obadiah feared the Lord. He feared the Lord greatly. He was someone, he was a believer. And he actually, you know, took a hundred prophets when, because Jezebel was trying to get rid of all the prophets of the Lord because she was a Baal worshiper. And she was bringing persecution against any of the prophets of the Lord. So when she was bringing persecution and having them put to death, Obadiah decided, he said, you know what, I'm going to help these people out. And he, was high, he hid a hundred prophets, it says, by 50 in a cave. So we got 50 of them to go hide in a cave. And then another 50 to go hide in the cave, you know, when she's going through the land and trying to get rid of them. So this is looked on here. And, the, you know, the narrator of the Bible is telling us, you know, which is the Holy Spirit telling us, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. So we know Obadiah's heart was right with God. And we see he, he was moved to, you know, help out these prophets of the Lord. Okay, and that was a good thing that Obadiah did. But we're going to see a little bit more about Obadiah and, uh, and, and see a little bit more that we can learn from Obadiah and the type of person that he was. But he, he definitely gets credit for doing this good deed of, of helping out those prophets. No doubt about that. Look at verse number five. The Bible reads, And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water and unto all brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive that we lose not all the beasts. So 
Ahab and Ob Obadiah are going out. He's saying, you go this way, I'm going to go that way. And we're, just, we're trying to find any grass, any water, anything left in the land so that our beasts don't die. I mean, there's this famine is all over the place. So if we can't find some food for our animals, they're all going to die. So that's their, their mission. That's what they're going out to do. And then in verse 6, it says, So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Verse 7, And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that, my lord, Elijah? So Obadiah, he feared the Lord. He runs into Elijah, and he's saying, Wow, this is Elijah, right? And he falls on his face, and says, are, are you that lord, my lord, Elijah? Is it really you? You know, I've heard all about you. In verse 8, he says, And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Now this is very telling because Obadiah goes to Elijah saying, Art thou that my Lord, Elijah? And Elijah answers Obadiah and says, Go tell thy Lord, referring to Ahab, that I'm here. And the type of person that we see that Obadiah was, he was a believer, but he was someone that was afraid to be a public believer. He was someone in his heart, he feared the Lord. In his heart, you know, he feared the Lord greatly, but when it came down to making it known, he didn't want anyone to know about it. He was afraid of the persecution. He was afraid of the repercussions of people knowing that, yes, I am a believer in the Lord. I do worship the Lord. And this is the problem we have with the vast majority of Christians, and it's only going to get worse as persecution gets hotter, right? We live in a time still, even right now, where persecution isn't that hot and heavy. Now, the worst persecution that people face as believers typically comes from their own family members or friends, people that you know in your life. And I don't want to just completely minimize that, because it is real, it is something that we experience and it's something that actually gets a lot of people scared to not even talk about what they believe because they're worried about what their family and what their friends might think of them. But we see here when, when Obadiah confronts Elijah and he's saying, oh man, you're, you know, this awesome preacher is here. Like, like, is that you, my Lord? You know, he had respect for him, but Elijah knows like, yeah, go tell your Lord. Because he had more fear of the man Ahab than he really did of the Lord, of God. He had a lot more respect unto Ahab than he really did of Elijah. Here he was, he's, he's excited to see Elijah. And we're going to see as it gets evident as we get further into this story. Because look at what he says. When Elijah answers him, he says, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah's here. So he sends him away saying, okay, you go tell Ahab that I'm here. What's his first thought? Verse number nine. And he said, what have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? What's he thinking about himself? What's going to happen to me? Oh, how could you do this to me? You know, you're sending me. You're a great man of God. Oh, I'm falling down on my face. Oh, wow. What, what are you doing here? What would you, what's God doing with you? What's he got for you to do? Yeah, I need you to go tell Ahab that I'm here. Oh, what are you trying to do to me? Get me killed? Oh, you want, you want me to go and say that you're here? And he goes on to explain, saying, you know, we've been, he's been seeking after you, and every time he hears that you're somewhere, you know, you're not there anymore, and, and he's getting oaths of the people of the land, and, you know, and if I go and tell him that you're here, then God's going to come and take you away somewhere else and protect you, and then he's going to kill me. It's me, me, me. What's going to happen to me if I open up my mouth, if I say anything right, if I go and do what you're telling me to do, I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to, you know, I might die. This is the attitude, unfortunately, that too many believers have today. They get so fearful and so scared about what's going to happen if I actually do what I'm supposed to do. We need, we need to get this lesson from Obadiah. And, and look, is it good that he hid those prophets of the Lord in the cave and, and helped them out in that manner? Sure it is. But I would say, what are they doing hiding in a cave anyways? Things wouldn't get as bad as they actually got to this point. And we'll see with Elijah, and we're going to see even in the next chapter as well, you know, 
He's, Elijah's of the, of the impression that he's all by himself. He's all alone. You've got a man of God doing great things, doing great works. God, he's got God's ear. He's praying to God for it not to rain. It doesn't rain. He's going to pray for God at the end of this chapter for it to rain. It's going to rain. He's being, being looked after. He's being protected. He's the only one standing up and being bold enough to say, thus saith the Lord, and preaching and delivering the message that God has. We know there was at least a hundred other prophets, yet he still says, there's just me here. Because You know why? It's not that he was the only believer. He was the only one standing up. Everyone else was going and hiding in a cave. Everyone else was going, oh man, I don't know. I mean, I don't want anything bad to happen to me if I preach the word of the Lord. Now, you could look at Obadiah and say, well, he, he had good reason to fear for his life. And there was serious persecution. Jezebel was going after and killing the prophets of the Lord, right? How much less persecution do you face and yet you're still fearful to give someone the gospel? Just to explain that, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, just, just yesterday, we had Brother Joseph was, was, uh, had a great sermon for us in the preaching class where he talked about, it was this very thing about overcoming being fearful about giving the, family, or giving the gospel to family and friends, people that you actually know. Because he, he was explaining that, you know, and this is true, I believe this to be true. It's a lot easier to go up to a stranger and knock on someone else's door you don't even know and preach the gospel to them sometimes than it is to talk to one of your close friends that you've known for a long time or a family member, yeah. right? Yep. Because you start fearing and wondering, well, if I bring this up, then what's going to happen to me, right? What's going to happen to our relationship? What's going to, you know, what are they going to think of me? Oh, you know, he used this example, you know, maybe you have a friend you've known for 10, 20 years, someone you've known for a long, someone you grew up with. And they don't know what you believe. I mean, first of all, I would say shame on you for that. Yeah. They ought to know. Why are you hiding it? Why are you living a secret life? Why are you going to church yet nobody seems to know about it? No one has any clue that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But secondly, you have this person and you start wondering and worrying and, and getting scared. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe they won't want to be my friend anymore. And you start having all these doubts that pop up in your mind. What's going to happen? Our relationship, my man, you might not be worried it's going to kill you like Obadiah was worried about, but you might be worried about it killing your relationship, killing your friendship. True. But you got to realize, and, that's, and uh, the credit goes to, to Brother Joseph Freeman yesterday for, for preaching on this, but uh, it's true. One day, your friendship's going to end. I mean, you're going to die one day. Your friend's going to die one day. And if they're not saved, guess what's going to happen? You're never going to see that person again. Do you want to have, I mean, is it really worth it to have the, the superficial friendship in this lifetime where you never bring up the gospel, you never bring up Jesus Christ, and you're willing to see that friend go to hell? Or is it maybe a little bit more worth it to risk the friendship to gain a friend for eternity? You might lose the short-term friend, but on the other hand, you might gain a friend forever. That is of way more value. And if you actually care about or love your friend, I mean, the one that you don't want to lose a relationship with anyways, how could you say that you care about that person if you're not going to warn them and tell them about hell that they're facing, that you know they're facing because you know their faith isn't in Jesus Christ? And that goes away for your friends, family, whoever. We need to overcome this fear in our lives. Don't be like the Obadiah. Don't live a secret Christian life. There's too many people doing that. We need to be out in the open about what we believe. I mean, hey, you're given the light, the light of the gospel. We need to let that light shine. He, he didn't give you the truth. He didn't give you this knowledge. He didn't give you his son, Jesus Christ, to hide it under a bushel. To not let anyone know about it. The whole point is to shine that light and to spread it in this dark, perverted world and, and preach the gospel and get people saved. That's the whole point. That's right. And the only thing, I mean, the, the biggest thing, keeping people from doing what they're supposed to be, from doing what you know. No one, can, no one that's saved can listen to this sermon and say, 
yeah, it's just not for me to preach the gospel. Yes, it is. Don't lie to yourself. It's all of our jobs to tell other people how to get to heaven. Amen. You could sit there and make excuses all day long, but deep down inside, you know what I'm saying is true. Amen. You know it's right. And the only thing preventing you from going and doing anything about it is fear. And it's, a, it's an unrational fear. You have more fear of man than you do of God if you're not preaching the gospel to people because you're worried about what they might think or what they might say. Obadiah had somewhat, somewhat of a legitimate reason to fear, but even still, he didn't, okay? He has way more reason to fear than we do today, but even his fear was, was not right and not acceptable because the Bible never teaches for us to fear man. Not once. Not once. We need to have the faith, first of all, that God can protect us and God's going to sustain us and God's going to bless us. He took care of Elijah. I mean, we're seeing this as evident. The last chapter, this chapter, we're going to see the next chapter. God is looking over those people that are standing up and saying, here am I. Send me. I'm here, Lord. I, I'm ready to be used of you, God. I, I'm going to step up. I'm going to act in faith. I'm just going to preach your word, and I'm going to let the chips fall where they may, and I'm just going to stand on the truth. God can protect anyone he wants to. He protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they, got, when they were faced with death. He protects Elijah. He, he kept him fed during the drought and the famine. He's keeping him safe, even though he's, he's confronting Ahab. Even when he confronts you know, the ruler of the nation, the king, that has the power to just have that man executed. But see, the thing is, he doesn't have that power unless God allows him to have that power. Jesus Christ said, you'd have no power over me at all. Remember when Herod, he's confronted with Herod, Herod said, don't you know that I, I could set you free or I could have you condemned? You would have no power at all except it were given you from my Father above. Amen. That is where we need to have the fear, in where the true power comes from. Right. If you are walking in his steps, man, what do you got to fear? Amen. Definitely not man. No matter how much man might think and, and puff themselves up and heave and ho oh and hum and, and, and get angry and, and whatever else. God could prevent him from doing any harm to you if, if, if God likes what you're doing and he sees that you're, you're, doing, um, you're doing his work. No problem. This is a theme that we're seeing. I think Elijah's a, a, a great um, person to look up to for that great faith and, and, to, and to see that. So we see Obadiah, let's get back into 1 Kings 18. We see Obadiah fearful. He's saying, oh, well, what about me? What have I sinned? What, what are you asking me to do? You're asking me to go and, and then he's going to kill me because you're not going to be here. We don't, we don't need that attitude. Let's not have that attitude that Obadiah had. And don't rely on your, on your, your past, uh, you know, things you've done in the past that have been good. Maybe you've done something great for God in the past. You can't ride on that your whole life. We need to keep doing right every day. Amen. Obadiah saying, and we'll see that here in a minute. Say, you know, but, but, but didn't you know how, how I helped you and I helped these prophets out and I did this good deed? Look, you did that however long ago. Okay? Right now, you need to go tell Ahab that I'm here. Look at what he says here in verse number uh, 10. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. So see, he's saying, he, in the same breath, he's saying that, look, you're going to be taken away and, that you're, and I'm going to be killed, but I fear God. Do you really? Verse 13, was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. We were told the same exact story previously by the narrator of the Bible, so we know that he's not lying here. He actually did it, right? Because 
if all we had was his statement, we wouldn't necessarily know. I mean, he could have been lying to Elijah, but we know he wasn't. I mean, it's told us. It's, it's verified. He did do this. But like, this is what he's relying on to, to show his faith and to say, oh, didn't I do this? In verse 14, now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. So now he sets up this meeting. He fin that's finally enough for him to say, fine, I'll go and do this. And thankfully, Obadiah did finally go, back, go and, and tell him. But, you know, we need to make sure we don't have this attitude. We're worried about what's going to happen to me if I go here. You know, a lot of people get worried. I've, I've had people comment, even family members, saying, you brought your family. And, you know, we go soul winning in South Phoenix, where it's like, you know, not the nicest area. And, you have a lot of crime and gang activity and things like that. You went over there. Like, yeah, I went over there. You think I'm worried about what man's going to do me? And actually, to be completely honest with you, when I go into those neighborhoods, I'm usually treated much better than I am going into the nice, safe, gated communities. <laughs> They're a lot more willing to get me picked up and tossed out of that gate when I go into those nice areas where I don't have to worry about crime. Then when I go into the ghettos, where, yeah, you might have some gangbangers hanging around on the corner, and they're strapped, and maybe they're dealing drugs. But when I walk around in that neighborhood, I'm a lot more likely to be invited in the house and given a drink of water, because the people are a lot more humble. Yeah. People are willing to listen. Wow. And even, even some of those the, the thug-looking guys, I, I, I'll talk to the thugs. Because you know what? Even a lot of them listen. And if you want anything to change, if you expect anything to change, if you don't like the situation that there's all this crime, what are you going to do? Hide your head in the sand or are you going to go out there and bring them the truth? How do you expect them to change their life if they don't have Christ? Bring them the gospel. It's the only way anything good's ever going to come. Sit still. What verse are we in here? Verse number 17. So we've got this meeting. Sarah, sit still. We've got this meeting between, Obed, or between Ahab now and Elijah. Obadiah went his way, and he's, and he's um, bringing Ahab to meet him. Look at verse 17. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Ahab knew that Elijah prayed and that it wouldn't rain. He was told that. So he's putting all of the blame on Elijah. And this is the way that people like to say, when you're in sin, this is the most common answer, or not the most common answer, the most common response uh, to, uh, to being confronted with your sin, right? Oh, it's, all, it's everyone else's fault. Right? Oh, this is your fault. Oh, everything that's happening in life, this is because of you. No, Ahab, it's because of you and your sin. This is, actually, this is actually the repercussion of you not obeying the Lord. You know, don't get angry at the, at the man of God that's telling you, hey, this is what's going to happen. Hey, here's the judgment. Hey, this is what's going to happen in your life. And then it comes to pass as if, like, they made it happen. Right? Hey, you go out and, and, and sleep around. Guess what's going to happen? You know, you're going to get a disease. You're going to lose your, your, your family, whatever. You know, God's going to come down on you and you're going to, you might lose your job. And then something like that actually happens and comes to pass. No matter, well, you made it happen. Why did you say those things? I didn't make it happen. You're the one that got into sin. You're the one that brought it on yourself. And this is the attitude that Ahab has. He's saying, you know, it's all your fault. Elijah answers, no, it's not my fault. That prayer wouldn't have even happened if you were doing what's right, if you weren't more wicked than every other king that was before you, if you're actually decided to lead these people in the way of the Lord instead of the way of your own wicked heart and following some devils. Verse number 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. I love, I love it. Look at the boldness of Elijah. He's speaking to the king. And the king says, you know, is it you? Are you the one that's troubling Israel? Right? He's angry with them. And Elijah's saying, it ain't me, it's you. You're the problem, buddy. 
and now I want you, go gather Israel. He's commanding the king and telling him, you go gather all Israel. You bring them over here. And the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table, his wife. Say, go gather all these people together. So Ahab sent, look at this, Ahab listens. That you're bold, you're following in God's word, you're speaking the word of the Lord, you got that boldness, you know what's going to happen sometimes? You don't need to be fearing as Ahab, he'll listen to you. This is what happened in the story. Ahab's told what to do and he listened. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. And again, this is another problem that we have in Christianity by and large today. People halting between two opinions. Sarah, sit still. People halting between two opinions. Not wanting to publicly profess what they believe. There was a lot of false prophets out there. There's a lot of these prophets of Baal. You had 450 prophets of Baal and another 400 prophets of the groves, right? All preaching is bad thing. But when all Israel was gathered, they didn't really want to say one way or the other. Because in their hearts, you knew a lot of them, they're not believing these false prophets. They're not necessarily Baal worshipers, but they're also not standing up for the Lord. And there was a lot of people that had faith that weren't saying anything. And Elijah's bringing it to a head and just saying, look, which one is it? What do you believe? Just, just come out with it. And I wish more people would just be honest and just come out with what they believe. Sarah, go sit in the back of the room right now. More people need to just come out and say, this is what I believe. But no, people are too scared today. Again, with, with you know, people want to bring up, oh, do you believe this about the Bible? Do you believe that about the Bible? Oh, can you believe, you know, the, the big thing now, what everyone gets all offended about is the homos. Right? The sodomites. Everyone wants to love on them and say, oh, well, look, do you, can you believe? Did you know that the Bible actually puts a death penalty on it? Yes, I believe that. Yes, I know it says that. And yeah, I'm not ashamed of it. You're not going to back me down on God's Look, it's the word of the Lord. Just as much as the Bible says, you know, that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah, all the Christians want to jump up and down about that and proclaim that and say, I love that. This is the truth. I'm going to stand on that till the day I die. Well, are you going to stand on the rest of the Bible too and not get ashamed and not get offended and not, not try to make excuses for what the Bible says when God's calling out wickedness and he's calling out evil and he's saying, look, this is the way you're supposed to properly deal with these things. That the rapist needs to be put to death. That the homo needs to be put to death. That the kidnapper needs to be put to death. Look, God's serious about this stuff. Don't think that you have a greater morality than God does. Because you've been brainwashed by this world into thinking that everything's okay, into accepting wickedness and all forms of perversion and wickedness that is just fine. There's not a problem with it. How long halt you between two opinions? Which is it? Do you believe the Bible or not? Because if you're going to believe the Bible, you've got to take it all. Right. You can't just cherry pick what you like and what you don't like and just choose to believe these things or those things. That's hypocrisy. You've got to believe it all. This statement reminds me even of Joshua. You know, unfortunately, there's so many people that, that do this, but at the, at the very end of the book of Joshua in chapter 24, Again, he, he, makes, he makes a clear statement to him. He's saying, look, it's up to you. I'll just read this for you. You can turn it if you like. We have Joshua 24, verse 14. The Bible reads, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua wasn't afraid to say where he stood. Saying, look, you need to determine that. Figure it out for yourself. Are you going to worship these other gods that can't save and they can't do anything for you? Go ahead. Go worship them. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to make it known that I worship the Lord. Elijah's saying the same thing. He's got all the children of Israel gathered. there, saying, choose you this day. Who is it? What's right? What's the truth? Is it Baal? 
And all these, and you, you, got, you got the majority there. You got 450 prophets. Go ahead, go with the crowd. Or is it the Lord? What Elijah does, though, he, he sets up this event here. I love this. That he's going to say, you know what? We'll figure this out right now. Notice how no one said a word beforehand. Everyone's too scared to, to, to put all their eggs in one basket and say, well, let's just, let's just wait and see how this, how this plays out. Thank God there was an Elijah during this time. Woe unto the people if there wasn't an Elijah with just a bunch of people too afraid to do anything. Even if they were believers, too afraid to say what they believe. Because you know what would happen? It would have got worse and worse and worse. The persecution would have got worse and, and until you got someone to stand up and fight. Say, I don't care what, if this is popular or not. I'm just going to preach the truth for what it is. Let's keep reading here. Verse number uh, 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. See, I'm, I'm the last prophet left. There's no one else, just me. Just little old me here. You got 450 of you. And I'm the only prophet of the Lord. The odds are stacked against him and as far as numbers are concerned. Verse number th uh, 23, let them therefore give us two bullocks. You say, okay, we'll settle this. Let's, get, let's pick out two bulls, two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves. You get first choice. Pick whichever one you like. And cut it in pieces, lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. So, okay, this sounds like a good idea. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to prepare a sacrifice. You pick out yours. I'm going to dress mine. We're going to prepare it. But the only thing is you can't put any fire under it, right? You could set it up however you want, chop it up, you know, put it on your wood, put it on your altars, whatever it is that you need to do, go ahead and do it. But you got to rely on your God or gods, whoever you're relying on to actually consume that sacrifice with fire. So that's, that's the deal. He says, in the God that answers by fire, that is the true God. And people are like, okay. Let's do it. So he lets them go first. He says in uh, verse 25, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For ye are many. So there's a lot of you guys. You guys go first. And call the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. See how he's ridiculing them and how stupid their belief is in these false gods because they believe in idols that can't speak, that can't hear, that can't do anything, that don't have any power, and they're making fools of themselves. Jumping up and down on their altar, and, oh Baal, and they end up cutting themselves and you know doing these things that are that are like you know self-sacrificial, and and it, when it gets really bad in this devil worship, this Satan worship, they end up killing their own babies, sacrificing Pazio the unto Molech is what we hear from the, the the Canaanites used to do, they would pass their children through the fire, because that was some big sacrifice for them to show how dedicated they were to their fake devil God that they were actually committed that they would just kill their, their, their children. And here we see him. They're, they're calling on and, hey, oh, Baal, hear us. And Elijah's like, oh, maybe he's sleeping. You got to wake him up. Maybe, maybe he went away for a little while and you got to scream louder and call him back. Because he knows there's no God. He knows that they don't have any power. Verse 28, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. You know when people are just cutting themselves and making all this blood gush out? That is not of God. That is a satanic religion. Okay? That is of the devil to be, to be destroying yourself like that and, and causing all the, you know, inflicting all this stuff upon yourself. That doesn't make you any more spiritual or holy. That's actually just of Satan. Let's keep reading. It came to pass when midday was past 
And they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. No surprise, right? So they're there. He lets them go from morning all the way until evening. Do whatever, you know, jump up and down, do whatever it is you need to do. Nothing happens. Nothing. They're preaching, they're prophesying, they're doing all this stuff, nothing happens. So now Elijah realizes it's his turn, verse 30, and Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. Come on, gather around here. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. The altar of the Lord was in disarray. It was broken down because of all the, the persecution and, and getting rid of the Lord. And he says, we're going we're gonna to restore this. We're going to bring things back the way they ought to be. Verse 31, And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now he's proving a point. Not only is the Lord going to answer by fire, he's going to answer by fire on a sacrifice that is completely drenched with water. So that there is no doubt, no question. It's not going to be one of these like, somehow we got a spark to go under. You know, he, he tricked us. He, he, he was able to do this and God didn't do it. He's saying, you know what? Get four barrels of water and just start dumping it on the, on the sacrifice. And then he says, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he says, do it the third time. And they did it the third. So 12 barrels of water just completely dousing this, this, this offering. And he had built a trench around it too. So after he had that poured four times, he fills up this whole trench. So there's water just all over this thing. Water surrounding it, water all over the place everywhere. And it says in verse number 36, and it came to pass the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. And notice he's doing this according still to when God has his offerings. He's, he's preparing here the, an offering of the evening sacrifice. An offering that is... That is um, prepared in a way that God wants it done. Except for the water. I mean, that was added as emphasis. And, and you know, God knows this and, and he's willing to, to, to perform this miracle because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a good reason for it. Verse 36. Um, so it came to pass the time of the uh, offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Remember when I preached, I think it was last week, and, and we preached this before, when, when the, the scripture in First Chronicles that says, the eyes of the Lord goeth through all the earth, seeking for, for someone that's gonna, um, that, that he might make himself known, seeking whose, whose heart is perfect with him, that he might make himself known. And see, God wants to use people so that he gets the glory and he gets the credit and he gets the honor. And this is exactly what Elijah now is praying unto God and say, let them know. This isn't for Elijah to lift himself up as this great, powerful man and look at how powerful I am and I can do this. He's saying, you know what, God, let it be known that you're God. Let's let you perform this miracle, Lord, so that they can all see and that there's no doubt about this, that Lord, you're the God. He's not saying, Lord, let them fear me. Lord, I want to have a bunch of people following me. Saying, no, we're, we're doing all this, God, so that they could all see and they could all know that, that there is a God in heaven and that it's the Lord. And he's saying that, 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 um, and that they know that I am thy servant, in verse 36, and that I have done all these things at thy word. That I am just following you and I'm doing what you told me to do. Verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, look at this, and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Fire falls down from heaven, just whoosh, everything completely consumed. It's gone. Drenched sacrifice, all the water, even the last of that water in that trench. Whoosh, no doubt about who the Lord is, about who the God is. 
And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And any time, you're going to find all throughout the Bible, any time anyone is confronted with even the slightest bit of the presence of the Lord, they fall on their faces. And they get real humble real quick. And that's why the Bible says that, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Amen. I don't care how proud and boastful, the, 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 the most boastful person on this planet that wants to mock God and ridicule people who believe the Bible, one day they will be on their knees and on their face saying, Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord to glory of, of God the Father. That will happen. No doubt. And we don't have to worry about it. So when, when people get their haughty, puffed up attitude, we don't need to, you don't even need to worry about it. No sweat. Go ahead. Be proud. We know what's going to happen one day. And that's why knowing, the terror, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Right? We go out and try to pray. Hey, look, look, man. You, <laughs> you may think this is all a big joke, but it's not the way it's going to be in the end. You know, we try to change people's minds and their hearts, but at the end of the day, it's not, you know, it's going to happen. And anyone who's confronted with the Lord realizes the power really quickly. And they fall down on their face. And that's what happened here. These people fall down. And then Elijah, verse 40, says, Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. This is a big event that happens, and God uses this to get the people's hearts back right with the Lord. What the, you know, they've strayed so far, and now they're just like, wow, you know what? Yeah, this is right. Now I'm willing to put all my eggs in this basket and say, yes, I believe the Lord. Because of this big, but see, they needed this big event to happen. You shouldn't have to be waiting on a miracle from God for you to, to show your faith or to even have that faith in God. You need to, we ought to have it like Elijah did beforehand. We know God's capable of doing all this stuff. You shouldn't have to have this event to, to happen in your life before you actually get motivated to do something for him. But I think it's interesting here too, and, and you see this throughout the Bible, when you have men of God, you know, don't be deceived by the way the world's going to try to tell you a man of God should be and what they should be like. Men, in the, the men of God in the Bible were men. And they weren't afraid to do the dirty tasks or the, do the hard things, no matter what it is. You have meek men. You have men that, that are humble. Elijah was humble. He gave God all the credit. But when it came time to, to putting down those, those false, wicked prophets of Baal, he did it. He did what he was called on to do. Now, I'm not saying we need to go out and start killing all the false prophets out there. But just get it through your head that Samuel, Elijah, these are men of God that did what needed to be done according to the Lord during their time. You know, that, that this, is, this is what needed to be done. They weren't just some limp-wristed, you know, faggy sounding you know, guy that's, that's just love everybody all the time no matter what. They cared about people. They loved people. Elijah cared about people. He cared about the Lord more than anything. But I mean, you go, you go through the Bible. Look at all the examples. I preached an entire sermon on that. You look at John the Baptist. You look at these men, men of God. They weren't wimps. They all had boldness to, to call out sin and, and to call like they saw it no matter who they were talking to, whether it be a king or a governor or, or any random person, Pharisee, whoever. They're willing to say, this is what God says. This is what the Bible says. And sometimes there's not a nice way of putting things. It's not a nice way to tell someone that they're going to hell. There really isn't. You just, it just, but it has to be said. It's not a nice way of saying, look, adultery is a wicked sin. And you ought not to be doing that because the Bible says so. Don't get fooled into people thinking like, oh, you're so judgmental. Look, it's what God said. It's what the Bible says. Now, it doesn't mean you nitpick every single thing that every person does that's wrong, every, every slight infraction, but, I mean, we're talking about some big things here. You don't, you know, you don't, you don't need to, to worry about what other people are going to say. We do what's right. Look, verse number 41. Finish up here. 
And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Look at the humility. He cast himself down on the earth. He's got his face between his knees. He's going to God now again in prayer, and he's praying for that rain, like we saw in James chapter 5 when, it, when it's referred, this story is referred to in his prayer for it not to rain and prayer to rain again. Verse 43, And said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And this again shows you that Elijah was not wondering whether God was going to hear him. He knew and was expecting the answer to his prayer when he got on his face and prayed for God to send that rain again. All he was doing when he sent his servant, he was just wondering, like, is it right now? And when it wasn't, he didn't say, oh, man, God didn't hear my prayer. I don't know what I'm going to do. He didn't give up. He prayed again. He said, you know what? Go again and check again. Go again. And he did seven times. You know, six times he got the answer. No, I don't see anything. God's not answering my prayer. God's not answering your prayers. Just, you know, maybe you're doing something wrong. Look, he knew and expected it was going to happen, and it took the seventh time, but then it finally was there. And, and right away, he knew. He was just waiting for him to see. And, he's, and his servant came back, and then he says, um, verse 44, And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. That's all he had to hear. He's like, oh, there's this, there's this little cloud coming. It's kind of like a man's hand. And, uh, and he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee now. He's like, this is going to be a big, this is going to be a serious rain. Go tell Ahab right now because the, the, you know, he finally started to see a cloud coming and it's like, it says it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. So, so this huge, massive storm comes. And uh, the Bible says, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And the last point here we, we learn from this is don't be dismayed, don't be discouraged when you're praying to God and it doesn't seem like your prayers being answered. Because it's all going to come in God's time. And if you're doing what God asks for you to do, if you're walking right, if you're, if, you're, if you're doing the things that he's asking you to do and you're listening to him and you pray to him, he's hearing you. He will hear you. There's all kinds of reasons why it may not happen exactly at the moment you expect it to happen. But don't think that it's fall, your prayers are falling on deaf ears. When Daniel was praying... He was praying to get this understanding of the vision in, uh, what chapter was that? Maybe 9 or 10? He was praying unto God, and it was 21 days after when, when he was approached by the angel to explain to him the vision that he had, and he was told then, he's like, look, from the very, for, when you were still praying, the, 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 the command came for me to come and talk to you, he says, but, but the prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days. There was an angel sent to Daniel. As soon as he started praying to God, that prayer was heard and being answered. The devil stood in the way and was fighting against him. And he said, it wasn't until Michael the archangel came, Michael helped me out and now I'm here. It took me three weeks to get here, but I'm here and, and I'm, uh, here's the answer to your prayer. There's all kinds of things going on that we don't even know about. Yeah. We don't know about. So don't let that discourage you. And you, you know, we're praying to God and you're saying, God, things aren't happening. I don't understand. You know, I'm doing what's right. I don't have any major sins in my life. I'm doing what you got me to do. Lord, I'm listening to you. I'm reading my Bible every day, but I need help in this area. Why aren't you helping me, God? There's always a reason. And never, ever doubt or worry that, that God's not hearing your prayer because he hears you. You may have to be looking for it seven times, but pray and be expectant. Pray knowing that God's hearing your voice. And, and as long as your prayer is according to God's will, which, I mean, Elijah knew his prayer was according to God's will. He was doing everything he was according to the word of the Lord. God had been, had been communicating with him what he was supposed to be doing. A lot of lessons to be learned in this chapter. We need to get that boldness. Don't be, you know, what Obadiah was great when he, when he hid the prophets and trying to help out, but we need to do more. 
You know, it's a shame that the condition got to the way it was in Elijah's day to begin with. That nobody was standing up. Why would you not say what you believe unless you're embarrassed or ashamed of it? Ultimately, what, what, what else? What other reason really is there? You're worried about something that might happen, something bad that might happen to you as a result of your belief? Well, if your belief is in the Lord, that you, we already, show, I already showed you that that's, that's kind of a silly you know, way of looking at it. We, we need to be more concerned with what, how God thinks than what man thinks and then have that faith. And we have no reason to be scared of even if the prophets of Baal are 450, even if you're talking to a king, it doesn't matter. We need more Elijahs. We need that spirit of Elijah in our church and in all, all the Bible-believing churches across this country and across the world. Imagine what could be done with that spirit. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great stories in the Bible, dear Lord. Help us to realize and understand that even though this is something that happened in the past, dear God, that you don't change. That you are still the same God. That, that these things are all still possible. These aren't just, this isn't just dead history. Something that happened a long time ago that, that can't happen anymore, Lord. You're still looking for people to use. You still are looking for your name to be glorified mightily and that the people would know that you are the Lord, dear God. We are fully confident that you are capable of performing just as many miracles today as you ever have been. As ever has been done, dear Lord. We know that you're able to do that, Lord. Use us to bring glory and honor unto your name. God, help us to be that great shining light and example to preach the word of the Lord, to preach the gospel unto the lost, dear God. Help us never to waver or to falter or to back down or to, or to sidestep what, what you have for us to do, dear God. Help us to remain strong and vigilant. God, build this church. Lead people here that have the same heart and the same mind, dear Lord, and, uh, and just encourage us and stir up our spirits to do what's right. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.